1942, and I was taking part in the Bataan Death March. And as I was marching along through the jungle, I look over to the soldier next to me, and I happen to notice that it's none other than uh, James Earl Jones there. And I look over at him, and uh, at the time he wasn't too famous, but in my circle, we kind of knew of him. We knew of his aspirations, and we look over, like I said, and I say, James, James, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? I, I, I didn't even know you were you were in the military, you know? I mean, as far as I knew, you were still performing back on back on Broadway, back stateside. And he looks over at me and with these black, just lifeless irises in the middle of his eyes, and he opens his mouth and just lets out this high-pitched scream, high-pitched screal, squeal, you know, it's just floors everyone, the soldiers just fall down left, right, and center, and all of us marching around, and we all fall down too, you know, I'm grabbing in my ears, and I can feel the warmth of blood seeping out of them, and after a few moments, I go unconscious. When I wake up, I didn't know it at the time, but it had been about a year later, lying on the pathway, it was a footpath, and at this time, it had been untended and was overgrown. My suit was tattered and, and damp and covered with moss, and around me were 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 just the supplies that the soldiers and, and everyone else was marching with, but but no bodies, no bodies. And luckily, uh, I managed to to get to a, a nearby port that uh, during the Midway campaign was, uh, as luck would have it, under Allied control. And I explained my situation to them, and they were confused, but they gave me a ride back to, uh, you know, stateside, and I met up with the with the military leaders, and I told them my story, and, and not only would I later come to find out that uh, there was no Bataan Death March where I was, you know, that that wasn't actually where the, the Death March was said to occur, what they say now, but James Earl Jones, in fact, uh, was not even old enough to be in the military at that time, and that there's no way I could have even known of him. I never knew what happened that day. But every now and then, I'll be sitting in my house, doing something, reading, sitting in front of the fire, preparing food, and out of the corner of my eye, I'll, I'll see this, this little flicker in my peripheral vision, and for a moment, I see the face of James Earl Jones in those black, just void eyes, and I look over real quick, and there's nothing there. Every now and then, before I lay down to sleep, in the, in the far distance, I can hear that that, that high-pitched screech just for a brief moment, enough that jars me fully awake, you know, and that feeling that you get when you snap up out of sleep because your brain, for a second there, thinks it's dead. But yeah, that's what happened. It was 1968, and I was driving through northern Mi Michigan, and it was a very, very cold and, 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 and wet uh, November day. The, the the snow was thick. There was at least three feet of snow on either side of the car, and as I was going down these back roads with nothing but my headlights to illuminate the way, I was slowly getting lost. I had no idea where I was, and it was hard to make out any signs as I went by them. So, but I kept continuing down this road because it was fairly clear, and I figured at some point it would get me eventually to the next town. And as I drove along, the, the trees on either side, the they just got closer and closer to the road until finally, basically, the road was overreached by these trees, which, as luck would have it, basically kept the snow out of my vision. The, the blizzard, wet blizzard conditions, sort of cleared up, and I could see more. And so I drove a little faster to get along and. As I went along, and in the far distance, it was, it was nothing but blackness. It was late at night, nothing but black, with the occasional uh, bright flash of white caused by my headlights panning over a snowbank. At one point, I make a hard left turn on this on this gravelly road I was traveling, and the radio I had on had been fading all night. I mean, I had the old AM stations on, listening to talk radio, and by now it was scarcely more than static, broken up by somewhat, in, you know, coherent voices speaking lowly about some political topic of the day. But, um, when I made this left turn in the road, in front of my headlights, there was a, there was a, a mist, a black mist, about the size of a person. It was very hard to notice, because 
I turned so fast that by the time I looked over there, the lights were no longer illuminating and I couldn't see anything. I didn't think it was weird at the time. I'd been dealing with whiteout conditions. There were countless animals around and it was very encroaching and, and I was just feeling nervous in general. So I continued down the path and I continue along and the trees uh, start to separate off the road again and the snow gets thicker. And when I get out of their, their, their canvas, that their canopy that is, was protecting me, giving me basically clarity from the snow, the, the blizzard is even worse. It's five times worse. It's, it's terrible. It's, it's hard to describe. But there was like a white mist around everything because the snow itself was so heavy and my head, only light I had of the of the headlights was causing this, this, this diffusion of the light. And i going along and the road gets worse again and I have to slow down and it was around this time that I look up in my, my rear view mirror and every now and then I just see my my bright red tail lights just illuminate something that couldn't pick up the light. They panned over something that almost made it look like that there was no snow or anything there. Like a, just the blackness went over the the red glow of the tail lights. And like I say the snow was thick. My headlights were illuminating it, the tail lights were illuminating it. And I look in my side view mirror and I would occasionally just no longer be able to see anything. It was like the mirror looked into some sort of void. At about two hours, I'd gone maybe five miles after exiting the, the forested area. It was just, conditions were terrible and the road was getting worse and worse. And I swear it was getting narrower and narrower. The snowbanks were getting closer and closer. And there were no cars. I'd seen no one else. I didn't even know, you know, where I was. At this point, the radio was useless. I turned it off, and it was dead silent. Nothing but the grit of the tires as they went over the snow, and that that painful absence of noise which a blizzard can cause. There was no no wind, no wind, just heavy snow. And I noticed in the back seat, for a brief moment, I, I see that black mist that I, I'd seen back in the forest, sitting in the back seat. Now, at the moment, some of you might have just looked back to see if something was there, but I didn't do that. I just took it for granted that there was something back there. I kept my hands on the wheel, my eyes looking forward, and it was back there. I know it was. And I just kept driving along. And there was that silence, that almost negative volume that a blizzard causes. It just absorbs sound so much. It's almost like sound is, is so not present. It's lacking, and it's distracting almost gives you a headache and the snow banks are getting higher on each side and my my red tail lights don't even illuminate the snow anymore and I know there's something behind me and the headlights the snow is getting thicker and thicker I can only see maybe a foot ahead of me and and the white mist that dances around the atmosphere around my car is more and more present and I finally my hands gripping the wheel deep inside my winter gloves I, I, I just whisper out a hello and I look up briefly in the rearview mirror, and I know it's back there, and I get no reply. And I just whisper up a another hello. I, I say, I, I know you're back there. What, what would you like? And no reply. I drive on about a half hour, and all of a sudden, it just kind of clears out ahead of me. The snow gets less and less powerful. The snowbanks shrink on either side. My headlights illuminate further and further ahead. The white mist is gone. There's sound around. I can hear the engine and the tires once again. The tail lights are illuminating things. And that's when I noticed that that thing in the back is is shrinking. The snow continues to dissipate on either side of me. And suddenly I realize it's raining. It's pouring, in fact. I flip on my my white windshield wipers to their highest setting. I'd had them low because of the snow, and they're slapping off the water. I turn on the radio. It's clear, clear as a bell. Every AM station I want is back in, and the black thing is no longer in the back seat. And I continue to drive on. I look down at my watch. I know it's about 3 in the morning. The snow is nearly gone, and, and suddenly... 
trees start to show up again. It's like I'm out of that wasteland of white. Eventually I see lights ahead of me, indicating a town. My anxiety's kind of subsided, so I go in, I pull into the first gas station I see, and the rain is just coming down hard, hard. And I pull in there, and the door flies open. And out comes the gas station manager. And he says, you didn't come from that direction, did you? He pointed in that direction. And when I came from, I didn't know if it was east, west, south, whatever it was. And I said, yeah, I did. And he looks at me in the eye and says, you're not around from around here, are you? I said, no. This time I'm getting out of the car. I'm thinking of getting a snack. I should probably gas up. And my eyes keep looking in the back seat, you know. I just wondered. And he said, well, those, those are the Dover Woods. You don't ever want to go in there when it rains. Again, someone would have maybe thought he was beginning to tell some sort of scary story. And I and I, I asked him, I said, is there something out there? He said, yeah. He said, I bet you money that you've been driving through snow for the last who knows however long since you left here. And I look at him and I go, since I left here, I've been following that road nonstop since I passed through the town before it. And he locks eyes at me and he says, son, you came from this town. You came back down that road. You turned around at some point. You just didn't know it. And I pushed him and I said, Well, how did you know it, it was snowing out there? He says, Well, that's just what happens. It likes the cold. It doesn't like the heavy rain. We don't know if maybe it makes the rain snow. It's just cold enough out there or if the snow isn't real. But as far as I can figure, if you never turned around at no point, there ain't no telling where you've been. You went through the through the grove, didn't you? And you said, yeah. And he said, yeah. Well, that thick grove of trees that you went through, that's about two miles from here. After that, you go through a mountain pass. And you head down towards Bradbury, a little town there. If you say you've been driving for five hours through there, I can tell you one thing, son. You ain't been driving on this road. I don't know where you've been, but it took you there. I knew exactly what he meant. I knew what it was. We didn't even need to speak about it. So I gassed up the engine and got real quiet. And as I was paying for the gas and everything, I said, Does it follow you around? Am, am I safe? He said, Yeah, you should be fine. Just don't ever go through those Dover woods when it rains. Of course, I don't think you'll ever be coming back. You won't have to worry. Just uh, in the future, when you're driving at night and it gets a little snowy, if you start seeing something odd, I just pull over and wait till it passes. As far as I know, you should be fine, but no one knows what it is out there. But let me tell you, I told you that grove of trees two miles from here, I can think of, in my mind, six cars that had disappeared, never seen again going through there. You're probably lucky you made it. Maybe it's simple that they they run off the road when it's snowy, and like I said, they sure as hell ain't around these parts by the time they drive through that snow. I don't know where they're at. They crash and get lost in some foreign, foreign land, some other dimension, whatever you want to say, but you're lucky you made it. And after that, I drove into town. I just decided to stay at a motel, and lo and behold, he was right. I was in the town that I'd left. So I just sit down and sleep the night. But every time after that, when I'm driving late at night for job, work, pleasure, whatever, and it starts to get a little snowy, I start to see that white mist set in that says the snow's going to get heavy. I just pull over and I wait. I wait till it starts raining. I wait till it does something. And if I'm ever out there, and rain turns to snow, even before I can pull off, I swear, just sometimes, on the outer vision, the outer field of vision that my, my car lights make, there's just brief glimpses of some sort of black mist.
it was about I think about about 1988 and I was down in Miami I was enjoying myself living it up on the beach having fun you know still the coke scene was going on down there you know how it was and uh, I was staying in this cheap little hotel that was off a little uh, ding dingy little street somewhere off South Beach Basically, my room overlooked an alleyway. It wasn't anything to write home about, but it was cheap. I didn't spend a lot of time in it. I was out eating, dancing, drinking, out on the beach. But, you know, I did go back there to, of course, sleep and use it as a locker for my stuff. One night, about two in the morning, in the distance, the rumble of thunder. It's Florida. You get rain a lot. It's not like the rain we had back home. It's warm rain, but you know, it does rain a lot, and thunder sometimes comes with it. I'm sitting there, basically just watching whatever television comes through with the really bad reception we get. News stations, mainly locals, sim, old sitcoms I've only seen about five times over. That rumble keeps uh, coming out, and I look out the window, and there's just no rain. There's never any rain. I just hear the rumble. Well, I go to bed that night. I don't think anything of it. A few nights later, I, I come on back. And I hear the rumbling again. It's earlier in the night this time. I'm sitting down, actually filling out a postcard to send home to family. and Just sitting there and hear that rumbling again. Now, I've seen it rain since then. We haven't had one thunderstorm. You know? I mean, I know it was only the next night, but like I say, it rains a lot down there and it comes and goes. But in all the days I'd been there, I hadn't heard a thunderstorm. But I kept hearing that rumbling. Well, I opened up the, the blinds, and like I say, I, I overlook an alleyway. There's nothing to write home about. I look out there, and black top illuminated by a old street light that's casting a orangey-yellow glow on it. There's no one out there. It's quiet. For an 11 o'clock on, I believe it was Thursday, it was probably about normal. Next night will be busy. The bars around there, and people probably going up and down the alleyway. Look out there. I hear the distant rumbling, and I try to see if there are any clouds in the sky, and I just don't see any. Well, I say whatever. Finish filling out my my postcard, you know. I put it in my bag, and I'm gonna take it out the next day, and. I'm in the bathroom, washing up before I go to bed, and I hear that rumble. And I swear as I look up in the mirror that I just see it shake, it vibrate a little bit. All of a sudden from above me I hear this BOOM! Deep pound noise from the room above me. I say whatever. I deal with it. You know. It's a little late, but I'm not in bed yet. I don't really care. So I keep washing up. I keep hearing pounding from above me, you know. And sometimes it's like that boom, that initial bang I heard, you know. And sometimes it's just kind of quiet. It is what it is, I suppose. I'm getting into bed. Around this time, it's about midnight. I lay down. I turn off the light. And I had the blinds cracked so I can see some of that street light that's illuminating the alleyway and see it coming in. I'm not a big fan of sleeping in the total dark. I guess I just get a little paranoid. That damn rumbling it just keeps going on and on, off and on. At this point, I figure it's probably not rain. It's a nearby business, and at night, they do something that sounds like rumbling thunder. But then the banging upstairs starts again. And it's loud. And it keeps happening. Now, it doesn't sound like footsteps. It just sounds like someone is consistently smacking the same spot on the ground over and over again. I doze off a little bit. I wake up about 1.30 to another bang up there and the rumbling outside. And and I was tired. The next day was... The day before I had to go home it was my last full day there. And I just... I really wanted a good night's sleep, so I got up, and I threw on an overshirt, and lights are still off, you know, and I go, and I open the door, grab my keys, and I decide I'm going to go upstairs, and I'm just going to knock on the door and talk with whoever's up there. I get out in the dingy hallway, and this hallway, middle of the night, is dead silent. 
like I say, this is not an expensive hotel. Dead silence, the lighting's pretty blah, the carpet's ugly as hell, but whatever. I'm not paying too much for it. I make my way up to the staircase. There weren't any elevators in this place. And I go up the go up the stairs, go up to the next floor, and when I get up there, I notice that it's considerably darker than the floor I was on, but like I said, it's a dive. Well, what do I expect? I make my way down the hallway to the place that's right above me. It looks just like my hallway and stuff, except like I say, it's a little bit darker and a little bit grimier. The whole floor is it's a little bit grimier. And I get up to the door, and before I knock, I just get this feeling to lean in and listen. I lean in and I listen, and it's, you know, silent as a crypt. But whatever. I know I heard something. So I pound on that door. You know, knock, 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 I don't get an answer. Knock, 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 I don't get an answer. At one one thirty in the morning. I don't want to wake anyone else up, but damn it, I don't want this stuff to start up again. So I knock as hard as I can, and you know, I hear in the room next door, I hear kind of a shuffling. I figure I've woken someone up. and No one's responding, so I go, whatever. I'm going to head back down. If, I, if they make noise, I'll try one more time. Hell, if they don't answer, I'll slip a note under the door, and if this is a problem, shit, I'll just say something tomorrow to the front desk clerk. So I head back downstairs, back to my place. I kind of feel a bit relieved to be back on my floor. And when I get in my room, I get in, and um, I'm noticing that, like I said, I hadn't turned on any lights before I left, but the light that's coming through my window is a little redder than it was before I went up. So I think, whatever. Toss off my shirt, get back in bed. I still hear the rumbling, but it's quiet upstairs now. It's about six in the morning when I get up next, and the street light's off. It's just, you know, light is barely starting to come in. You know, I mean, it's pretty light out, and I can hear that damn rumbling. Well, I don't know exactly what woke me up that night, but something got me up, so I stood up and figured I could use the bathroom, get a drink of water, and I do so. I use the bathroom, and I get a drink of water, and I come back out, and on the foot of my bed... A little piece of plaster from the ceiling, maybe about two centimeters long. There's a little bit of plaster dust around it, and I look at the plaster and I look up at the ceiling. And it had fallen out of the ceiling, clearly. I think it's kind of weird, but I look closer at it, and there's a bit of a divot there. It's a bit of a divot, like something's pushing on the ground from above and it cracked it. And like I say, this place is not an expensive hotel. So I say, whatever. Clean it up. I go to bed. Whatever. I wake up at 9 o'clock, and this time I'm up for good, you know. I think I've had enough sleep, or at least I feel like I have, and I get up, and uh, there's more plaster on my bed, you know. It's falling apart. And then it dawns on me. I heard someone banging around up there. God knows what was going on. They probably were still banging around. I just slept through it. Whatever. I get up. I change, I look out in the hallway, you know. Rather, I look out in the alleyway first. That's what I mean. You know, it's just the same boring alleyway. And then I go out in the hallway. And, um, you know, I head for the staircase to go downstairs. They have a continental breakfast there, and I figure I'll enjoy it. And as I'm going down, I get met by the uh, night front desk clerk. He's on his way up. I guess his shift was probably just about ended, and he was going... Upstairs, who knows what? And I, you know, bid him a hello, and he bids me a, a bit of a nervous hi. Decided to mention to him, I said, you know that that room above me, that uh, that room above me. I I don't know what was going on there last night, but there was some banging and stuff, and you know, and they were kind of keeping me up. And I went up to try and talk to him. They wouldn't wouldn't answer the door. And he looks a little bit not scared, not shocked, just kind of confused. But he nods along with my words, and he says, well. Hopefully for your last night here, you know, they'll quiet down. I'll I'll have a word with them. I say, okay. Well, the next night, after I finish another day out there, I go back into my room. When I get in, there's lots more plaster dust around, but no more plaster's really falling off the ceiling. But I do look up, and I see the ceiling is considerably divoting. 
Well, I want to tell front desk about this. I don't know what the hell happened up there and what got broken. I don't want some shit falling on me, you know, in the middle of the night. But as I do this, it's about 6 p.m., and I notice that the street light's on. And this time, it's most definitely a red light. It's not the same light it was before. I definitely noticed it was red. I don't know why, you know. It's red for whatever. You know, I, I look at the pane of glass. I look through it. And everything's tinted just a little bit red. But I figure it's just the overpoweringness of light. So whatever. I go downstairs, front desk. I go, hey, I don't know what was happening in the room above me last night, but it looks like the damn floor, my ceiling, is falling through. It's the same night guy who I'd met before on his shift, you know. Actually, when he was getting off his shift. And he looks at me with that same kind of confused look, and he nods along for a while. And then he goes, sir, I just have to stop you. i got to tell you, that's not possible. There's no one staying in that room right now. I don't know what you heard, but basically our fourth floor, which is the floor I was on, we don't really rent it out a lot anymore. That's why it's a little bit, you may have noticed when you're up there, a little bit grimy. And the floor above you, we just we can't really rent it out right now. It's uh, undergoing renovations. And I go, well, there you have it. Maybe something's falling apart in there. You know, I, I start saying that to the guy, and he looks at me and he just goes, it's not really those kind of renovations, sir. Um, it's just not possible. What I'm going to do for you, in fact, is I'm going to get you another place to stay for this last night. I'm going to switch your room around a little bit. I'm going to put you down your hallway a bit. And you know what? I hate to do it, but honestly, now that you're talking about it, maybe I really should. And I go, well, you said nothing's wrong. And he goes, well, you know, and he kind of dodges the question. Eventually says, well, you, you, you say your, your ceiling's falling apart. We don't want anything falling on you. And he kind of chuckles it off. And so he gives me a new room down the hallway. I head back up to my room, open the door, pack my bag, and I notice that the light coming in is blood red. And everything outside seems tinted blood red. And that's when I noticed that that divot in the ceiling, it just seems darker for some reason. Just darker. And it's definitely sinking more, but no more plaster's really falling. But I am noticing there's lots of cracks radiating out from it now. I don't know what's going on. Pack up my shit. I go to my new room. It's beautiful, brand new, perfectly fine. Well, I get up. This is the day I go home. Check out at 10. I got a flight at 1. I'm ready to get down to the airport right now. It's a Friday. No, who knows? Actually, rather, it's Saturday. Day 4 was Friday. But, you know, I don't know how busy it is. I don't know what the airport's like. And on the way in, there were plenty of, you know, custom checks about drugs and cocaine. I guess I really had a problem there, but... As I'm heading back, I go by my room, and I notice that, basically, the door is, uh, is loose in the frame. And, um, there's grease stains on the knob. It looks like probably a maintenance man had been going in and out of there if I had to take guests. So I say, whatever, they're fixing it up. Go down to the front desk, I check out. Uh, the night guy's no longer there. Stay guy, wish me good day, whatever. Walk out with my stuff, start trying to hail a cab. And at this point, I look kind of down the alleyway. And I look over at my room, where the window was looking out. And that's when I notice that my window is indeed blood red. And it's Stained blood red. And I noticed that the window above it from the room above and the curtains are closed. But there looks like something red had been seeping out of the window, running down the side of the building, basically collecting on my window. I finally hail a taxi cab. He pulls up and I get in. We talk. And he starts taking me out of there. He goes, You know, I work this area a lot and I got a question for you. I said, What? He said, uh, You stayed in that hotel, right? And he names the hotel. I go, hey, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, that's why I was right in front of it. And he goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, uh, what floor were you on? That's the third floor. I said, yeah? Yeah, I'm just going to wager a guess. Did you stay in this room? And he names out the room name. And I go, yeah. Yeah, I did. And he said, I wondered if you did, because you had that look about you, that everyone I pick up here seems to stay in there to have that look. And he goes, uh, 
Did you ever go up to the fourth floor? I said I went up there briefly, yeah, to try and get talk to the neighbors above me who I thought were there making a racket, but you know. They said I don't want to stay in there and they gave me a room my last night because it looked like the damn place was collapsing. They said they were doing renovations or something and he basically cuts me off. He goes, yeah, yeah, I've heard that. He goes, you don't even know, do you? I said, no. Well, I guess I don't. Can you, you know, what the hell are you talking about? He goes, uh, did you, uh, look out the window before they moved you out of the room? He said, yeah. And he said, anything weird about it? He said, yeah. It was, it was, it was red, you know. There was something coming out of the room above me. And I said, basically in a joking voice, if I had to wager something, I said, the old horror cliche, there was blood leaking out of the window, you know, and, and he and he kind of grins for a second, and then he stops, and he goes, "Well, you're you're not too far off." He says, uh, "You heard noises up there, right?" He said, "Yeah." He says, uh, "Banging noises." I said, "Yeah." And he says, uh, "Was the ceiling damaged at all?" And he just keeps knowing this shit, and I go, "Yeah, yes, it was." And he nods along like he's heard it before, and he goes, "Yeah, that place." Talk about renovations. Your room and the room above you, they just never stop with the renovations. Every time someone stays, it just seems to happen. And I go, okay, you know what? You know something I don't know and something they didn't tell me. Why don't you tell me? He glances at me in the rearview mirror. He goes, all right. You know, I'm sure you want to know. And I go, yeah, whatever. And he says, yeah, probably no problem anyway. You're not staying there anymore. You don't got to worry. He says, the room above you, about two years ago, a couple rented it out. And uh, they stayed there about two weeks. And on the second or third day, I believe it was, the uh, the husband was seen coming down into the in, into the main dining area, whatever have you, lobby and that shit. He had lunch, and uh, he left. And he, as far as anyone knows, he never came back to the hotel. Well, um... After he left, some people complained they were staying in your room. They said there was a god-awful racket the night before. Upstairs and there, bumping and banging and just weird noises. And they were concerned. And they said, you know, basically people at the front desk like, whatever. You know, we're sorry about that. Yada, yada, yada. We'll tell them to quiet down. And since it didn't happen the next night, it was quiet. No one thought about it. Well, after two weeks were up, two weeks they paid for they hadn't checked out yet. So hotel management went up the fourth floor. And I guess they'd also been kind of receiving complaints. The people on the fourth floor were just a little stuffy, a little musty in there. It's just something off about the air. And whatever. And now this part, I can't confirm. But the rumor down here on the beach has it is they went up there. They knocked on the door, said, hey, you got to go. Didn't get an answer. They opened up the door unlock it, open it up, and I guess right when they got in there, the furniture had been flung up against the walls, and in the dead middle of that floor was the wife's body. I say body because she was dead. Her head had been clubbed in, and I guess the walls were just painted with her blood. It was just everywhere. It was just everywhere. Now, the rumor continues on, and I don't have a lot of details here. And i got to say, at this point, I was kind of astounded. I was sitting there, didn't know what to say. He said, but at this point, basically, all I can ascertain is that there was uh, some writing on the walls in her blood. There was some uh, paraphernalia around the room, uh, unnerving and occult paraphernalia. And at this point... I buy the murder, but I think he's spinning me some sort of BS yarn and whatever, because now he's going overboard. This was the 80s. This was the time when they were talking about Satanist cults killing people in the backwoods of whatever state you were in. You know, that was all the rage. So I was like, oh yeah, oh yeah, mm hmm. I really wanted him to talk more about the murder. I believe that. He goes, yeah, they clean up the room, they get the cops in there, the coroner, they got a manhunt for the guy staying with her. And I guess the next. Uh, you know, the person staying right below her was really unnerved by this. They said, I swear in the night, you know, I swear someone was calling for help. And I'd heard it, but I just didn't do anything about it. I just, you know, I was just didn't think it was anything bad, so I complained the next day. 
And I guess he thought over the next couple nights, he might have heard something, someone talking up there, calling for him. Or them, or whoever it was. And I don't know. But um, what happened, they clean up the room, they get all the blood out, and everyone staying on that floor does not want to be on that floor anymore. And the person sitting below it, he just doesn't want to stay there anymore. But now they're in trouble because... Everyone wants to move rooms. They're booked to capacity. The weekend's coming, whatever. So they move everyone around. Some people leave the hotel. They try to accommodate everyone. Some people stuff stay on the fourth floor, and they're really upset about it. And the guy who stayed below it, finally he's like, I'll, I'll finish staying here, you know, in my room, whatever. I guess the, his checkout comes along a couple days later. And they'd been trying to clean the blood out of the room above, and I... Again, my rumor has it down on the beach they could not get that blood out no matter what they did and it just kept oozing out of all the cracks and everything and the window even had the blood oozing out of it and the guy below uh, he misses his checkout date like I say so they go in they open up the door and uh, he's laying right in the middle of his bed and uh, he's laying there dead his eyes glassed over and his throat has been crushed his head is bludgeoned and bruised that if something just pounded on his head. Well, now, you know, boom, second murder investigation. This place is not doing well, you know. Anyone who was still there leaves. That place just gets deserted. And, um, the rumor has it by the people who stayed near him that the night before it sounded like there was basically a crash in there. That something went through the floor above him. There was a muffled scream and a kerfuffle, whatever you want to call it, and then it went dead silent. And this was the night before. And uh, everyone says that basically what they figure nowadays is uh, she had called out for his help and he had heard her. And the rumor holds that he just thought to himself, I don't give a fuck if you're getting killed up there. I'm tired at night. I'm not going to come out and do anything. And the next night, after she was killed, her spirit called for help, and he ignored her again. That apparently he didn't go to the front desk and just say, oh, they were making noise last night. He made a fuss of it, and he offended that spirit. And basically anyone who ever stays in that room now, when there's a kerfuffle upstairs, you know, they tend to wind up dead, people who stay in that room now. They hear a noise, they wind up dead. And I'm just sitting there and I'm like, thinking this makes a little bit more sense now. And I go on and I tell him, you know, the full details of everything. And he nods along and goes, oh yeah. He said, uh, did you hear the rumbling? You know, because I told him about the rumbling. He said, did you hear the rumbling and do anything about it? And I said, no, I just, I just figured it was a storm. He nodded to himself. And he said, yeah, I think what saves your life. On that second night, you went up there to see what was going on. Or else you wouldn't be here right now. We get to the airport. He drops me off. He wishes me luck, whatever. And I get out. I'm feeling weird. And I do think it was weird he knew a lot of the details. But hell, if he's a cab, he likes to tell stories. He could have filled a lot of them in himself. But, uh, fly home. Think about it all the way on the flight there. I unpack my luggage, and I unpack my luggage, and I, I'm undoing my, my towels and shit and all that, and I notice that there's a, a postcard I had. Well, I, I'd forgotten to mail that son of a bitch. Well, I slap my forehead like, good job, man, and I turn it over to the front, and in a ruby red, kind of dark red, some sort of dried, almost like paint, there's a kiss on it, a lipstick kiss, and next to it, in tiny handwriting, fine, fine handwriting, and a black pen is the words, thank you, and, uh, as far as I can ascertain, if I'm one to entertain my own theories about this, I think that was from her, that in all those years, people kept hearing a noise, they didn't do nothing about it, so I guess if I want to leave you all with a with a moral of the story, if you hear a commotion upstairs, go see what's going on. Because if you don't, something bad happens.
people are going to be mighty vengeful.